everyone. I'm Jan Ledoux, Chairman of the Southeast Region of NSA, and I'd like to welcome you all to the second evening of our online conference, SWAP 23. Last night, under the heading of improving flock efficiency, Leslie Stubbings pointed out the potential for significant gains in profitability to be made by making small improvements in some of the physical measures of performance. Implicit in this is that we do actually measure performance rather than guessing. This evening, we will concentrate on this with our theme being measure to manage. I'm delighted to have independent sheep consultant with a particular interest in this subject, Matt Blythe, to chair this session this evening. Incidentally, Matt's been my co-conspirator throughout organising of Schwab. So over to you, Matt, to get this session underway. Thank you very much, Jan. And thank you, everybody, for joining us again for this second day. And hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow at Birmingham at the national event. Um, I'd like first to thank all our sponsors, uh, which these events wouldn't go on if we didn't have our sponsors sponsor us. So thank you very much to MSD, Alanco, Rapper, AgriWeb, British Wall and Cotswold Siege for sponsoring all of the swap events this week. We have got three excellent speakers tonight. Um, we're going to start. We're going to start. Um, brain's got sleep. Sorry, Jan. <laughs> Um, we've got we're going to start with the first speaker and we um, we'll start with the first speaker and we will then go on to Duncan Nellis and Nerish Wright. So over to you Lawrence to start us off. Um, Lawrence is a farmer up in Scotland and he is an ambassador for AgriWeb. So it's going to be interesting to see how he's using AgriWeb and all the other technology he is involved with to make that work on his farm. So over to you, Lawrence. Thanks very much, Matt. It's uh, it's a real honour to be asked to to come and talk to talk to everybody tonight. Um, uh, as Matt said, I'm just I'm a humble farmer, um, very very passionate about performance recording and getting the best from my farm, like most of you who um, have joined us this evening. So I've got a small presentation just to talk to you a little bit about what we do. Um, I, I'm very much a, an ambassador and advocate for AgriWeb. I don't, don't work for AgriWeb. I'm certainly not not paid to say the things I'm going to be saying this evening and, and, and sort of talking to you about. So um, it's very much from my own experience and, and, and how I found the program itself. So um, I'll start those now. So um, I'll, I'll sort of jump into right, a little yeah. bit about me and yeah, the, have you got the me there? Things, yeah, I was trying. I, I got it all written down, but I'm trying to read it and sorry, Matt, are we okay? <laughs> I think you're good to go, Lawrence. Are we good to go? Good stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm actually a, a new entrant into farming. Previously, uh, I've had a, a plethora of different jobs um, from hospitality to working for the, the lifeboat service. And the latter stage of my career before entering agriculture uh, was working for Sky Television um, as, a, as a project manager. So very much data orientated. Um, performance orientated and uh, yeah, numbers, figures, output, input, um, all the sort of things on top level that we're interested in on farms. So um, about seven years ago, uh, I met a woman, Day Tucker, uh, in Stirlingshire through the wonders of social media. And uh, we became great friends. I didn't know one of the sheep to another, I was just very passionate about starting farming and uh, she gave me a chance to get some experience. Went to uh, Oak Ridge College and studied agriculture, then on to a modern apprenticeship 
Um, and that's kind of where my, my journey started. And as much as I couldn't contribute much in the way of agricultural expertise at the beginning, what I could contribute is IT skills, understanding what performance meant, um, and, and analyze the data and the information that we were getting as we were sort of introducing technology and um, scanning EIDs, weights, weight gains, um, and exactly what that meant for our profit and loss at the end of the year. Um, through that very short and quick seven years, I've, I'm now an NFUS um, Next Generation Committee member. Like I said, we're an uh, ambassador for AgriWeb. I'm also an ambassador for Landra Scotland. Um, I currently farm 200 pedigree clins that are kind of split between a, a pedigree replacement flock and a commercial uh, commercial flock crossed with a terminal sire. And most recently, I'm very, very passionate about my Galloways and um, native breeds. So, um, and hopefully moving into the, the blue grey. So that's... Um, that's where I'm at at the moment. And in a few weeks' time, I take on my first tenancy uh, over on the east of Scotland, which is endlessly drier than the west. So hopefully that goes well. Um, but yeah, so my, my passion for the sheep and, and making sure we're getting the very best out of, uh, out of what we've got uh, led me to start looking at different software programs. Um, other software programs are available. I, lo I landed eventually on AgriWeb. Um, very impressed with what they had to offer, the diversity and what we could, what we could gather, and then how what they did with that data and turned it into useful information. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about what they do, and why I decided to be an ambassador for them, and 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 um, how we kind of use that on farm. Stop sharing on screen. Yeah, we're still sharing, Lawrence. Yeah, sorry. Um, so that's a little snapshot of um the farm that I manage currently for for the Tuckers. Um, that gives us a little bit of an overview as we log into AgriWeb, which has a, a web-based service as well as a mobile service. Um, this gives you a really good overview exactly what it is that we are farming at the moment. Um, some of our uh, names of our fields, where the sheep are currently. We're coming to the end of the season where there's a bit of a dispersal going on on the farm, as I said, as I'm moving away. Fat lambs are, are pretty much all gone, and we're just looking at replacements, the small flock that's going to stay behind, and the cows that are still to, to be shifted on. So that gives us a, a good idea of where the stock land on, on farm. Um, we've then... Got a bit of an overview. I've only been given sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, and I'm going to try my very best to sort of tell you what it is we're doing, and like I say, what Agri have have to offer and how it's going to change change our farming practice. I could go on for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah, so uh, all the data that we input goes through. We have a combi clamp system. Uh, we scan EIDs, weights. Uh, we target birth. All sounds like very, very labor intensive. Um, sort of recording, but what we get on the other side of that is speedy decision making, accurate decision making, and really see the gaps and the holes in, in the performance of the farm where we, where we weren't able to see before. Um, this is a snapshot of, of some of those, those uh, reports that we can pull from the information that we put in. Two years ago, we ran uh, an offspring report, which basically tells us exactly as it says on the tin, the lambs that have come from those particular use for the period of time that we've been recording the information. And from a, about a 400 strong flock of, of clins that we're, we're doing, what we thought was was quite well, we were doing, we were doing good. We had a, a reasonable um, balance at the end of the year and um, scanning results looked good. We culled 150 of those sheep based on the information that we were able to pull and the detail that we were able to go into. The following year, the bank balance was still exactly the same. We had nearly the same amount of lambs on the ground and the amount of feed that we purchased, vet bills, wormers, they all went down. So a little bit of an idea of what it is that we were able to, to pull from that information. 
Um, this is our very last batch of lambs. I tried to use information that's as, as relevant as possible. And um, we were able to just take a snapshot of the 54 lambs that will be going very shortly. Uh, we sell everything fat as much as possible. Again, depending on grass and feed prices, then more recently, again, we've been able to calculate for every kilo of feed uh, eaten by a sheep, how many grams that they're putting on and how much we're getting per gram from uh, Scott Beef or Dunbar or the market and whether or not that's a viable thing for us to continue to do. Um, we've been able to calculate this year that it's not. So once the feed is, is finished, which will be probably in the next couple of days, we'll know exactly which ones are going to go fat and which ones will go to store. And here we're able to see very, very clearly what our pure clean lambs are doing against the, the Beltex Charolais crosses. If this was a, a, a live... Um, snapshot of AgriWeb, I could select particular lambs, see exactly what their growth rates are, where the resilience is, look back at the mothers, and they're the mothers that we would then keep to say they're producing lambs with, with high growth rates. Um, this is a very transparent and honest view of, of uh, heads of sheep that have been sold so far this year, total value, average price per head. Again, we can do all of our accounting on here for feed, uh, a cost per ewe, cost per lamb, for medicines, wormers, absolutely nail it right down to how many pence or how many pounds we've spent on each individual task that we, we, we take, if that's shearing, even transportation, um, anything like that, all goes to each animal per head. Um, treatment records, um, I'm actually on a scanning course at the moment down in the, in the Midlands and somebody was asking me, oh, can you put your treatments in and see exactly what lambs get what, what ewes get what and how much you're, you're, you're spending on each individual treatment. Very simple overview, very simple report. Um, I support a number of different farmers who are looking to take a transition into, into performance recording or just being able to... Um, computerize what they're already doing on a, on a very basic level and this is just shows you how easy and transparent it is in the view of AgriWeb. Each individual ewe, every individual lamb is recorded on farm. We can see an overview of exactly what their curve is. This is one the It looks like Lawrence has frozen for a minute. So hopefully he will reconnect and continue telling us about what's happening. How he's using AgriWeb, etc. looks like we've completely lost him um oh awesome man, which i'll go on in a minute it tells us exactly how old hold on lawrence we lost you for a minute Are you there lawrence Is uh, Lawrence, you there? No. Oh, you there, Lawrence? Is this just me or is it everybody? No, no it's everybody. No, Lawrence, no. Uh, no, we've lost Lawrence. Well, we because he, he's video, but he's frozen. So yeah. I think he's having I've, technical issues. I've, 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 got got him on the, just me. I've got him on the phone, Matt. I mean, 
Katie, if if he disconnects and just comes on with his uh, sound, can you do the um, slides from your end? Uh, yeah, I can try that. Be no problem. Bear with do me. you want to try that, Lawrence? Can you hear me? We'll give Lawrence a few seconds to dial out and dial back in, and hopefully he can inform us what he's doing with all that data. Um, so, I'm panicking now because I was a naughty girl and I haven't sent my slides in to a central <laughs> place, so I'm now panicking everybody. I <laughs> I'm also think, filling the gap. <laughs> I think we were when we lost him. It was around here, wasn't it? Talking about individual. Um... He was talking about his vet and meds and bits and pieces. All there. Been sold yeah. as replacements. She's been in Frozen. every single time she's been scanned. Absolutely everything. Right, Lawrence. <laughs> Two years ago, what we can only describe as a, a freak incident to see where they had crossed over, hitting that way back based on the only time. Not for me, I don't think, hopefully. Yeah, you're you can hear me okay on the chat, we, can you? We can hear you all right on the webinar, Lawrence, yes. Just to update you, Lawrence, um, I've, I'm sharing your slides for you Super. now. So I've just got the... Um, the slide up, I don't know if you can see them, um, sharing sort of your vet and med um, info. So I don't know if we can go back to where we were on that one. I can. Perfect. Yeah, sorry, can, can you hear me okay now? Yep, absolutely fine, thank you. Great. Excellent. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. We we lost him again. One yeah. of technology. Just coming and going. It's muted now. Yeah. Would it disrupt the session to move on? Like, like I said, I'm, I'm actually not obviously saying is there are keeps just muting. keeps muting in and out for some reason. I was wondering if we should we move on if Duncan's ready. Should we Duncan, move on? Yeah. yeah, move on to Duncan's and we'll see if we can catch up with Lawrence at the end to finish his presentation. You there, what? Duncan? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'll put myself up. So are you all right to start me sharing my screen? Yes. I'm sure we are, Duncan. So yeah. this is Duncan Nellis. Duncan well, owns a farm. You own first, you do. Um, uh, just north of Newcastle, if I remember correctly from my travel up there. Yeah, Northumberland. Um, Northumberland, yes. Yeah. Um, you you bought the farm about quite a few years ago, didn't you? Um. Well, the the home farm we were tenants for about. Um, uh, 90 years my great grandparents came as managers and then got tenancy and we bought a home farm in 96 and then we've managed to add a few other bits on and um, and a bit of tenancy as well so yeah it's uh, it's yeah the, 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 the expansion has been well fairly rapid in the last few years if I'm honest um, but yeah we're just sort of uh, or like just looking for opportunities, uh, so when they they seem to have sort of fallen in our lap, and sometimes you think, sometimes you think with opportunities, you, you know, if it was only a, a year down the line, but we tend to th we tend to think that you're never really ready for them, uh, you know, you never really have a thousand use for this place or a couple of million to buy the next spot, you know. So. So you're never really ready for opportunities. So you've just got to kind of, uh, well, in our experience anyway, we tend to just like very lucky in a uh, in a family partnership that we all get along and or uh, and pull together. So we're able to take these chances. Um, before you start, Duncan, I must remember and say, can everybody who's 
wants Amtra points or Rosa points, please put your name and your numbers in the chat and we will log them to give you your points later. Thank you. And now over to Duncan to tell us about what they do. Interesting oh, well, story. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, that's it's great. I'm sorry, like I was I was enthralled with Lawrence's uh, thing there. It's great to hear somebody coming like on that uh, that fact based journey in farming. It's uh, it's something that you don't always get to. Um, isn't always taken up. Uh, I, I feel sometimes, and we don't make enough of that sort of. Uh, of, of our own data and our own, um, you know, of what we can gather on our own places. I mean, just, I'll give you a quick overview of our place, like Lawrence did. I'm Duncan Nellis, a farm in a family, a sort of a five partner family partnership uh, near sort of Rothbury and Northumberland in the Coated Valleys, our main spot. Found my brother Angus. Um, I'm fourth generation and we're pretty confident about having a fifth generation coming along. Um, we've had a um, board kit first clean use in 1996 uh, and um, we have had them since then they are pedigree and performance recorded so now we're up to about we we'll fluctuate but we've had more clean use at, at times at the minute we're running about 1900 and uh, we'll have 600 new lambs to go to the ram this year we'll work on work on uh, with a few arable places in Berwickshire, uh, on good arable ground that use organic, that are organic arable places, and we use their clover breaks. I've uh, got 260 Angus based suckler cows that kind of crisscrossed the, with Hereford, but they're not what you'd say was a classic boldy yet. They're probably still very leaning towards more Angus. Um, been enclosed in the sheep flock since 2003 and the cattle since 2013. Um, we try and finish everything as much as we can fat, do Christmas turkeys. We're all organic and we'll put the 860 hectares. That is a, a 300 hectares has just gone onto that this year with a new tenancy and about half owned, half rented. Um, actually, I should just. There we are. Um, so we're always been very big on data collection. This is a signet slide, so it's a little bit out of date but where we started. Um, so we, when we started Lamin Outdoors in 2007 and, I, and like we started to engage with EID uh, with um, Border Software, um, it's it's sort of, we've just kept on expanding that that sort of thought process because we believe it's given us value. Um, so uh, we are probably at a higher number than that now. I mean, we were recording Last year with the Ram Compare project, we recorded about 3,000 lambs on birth and notification. Uh, everything gets a, uh, as much as we can, gets an eight week wait. We don't scan, and everything that's alive gets a scan wait or a slaughter wait. Um, we only scan about 250 uh, lambs a year. Um, but um, that's part of where, where we are with it. We're also part of the New Breed for Change project. So, and we've been doing the um, IGA serum. So, we started with the IGA saliva and now we're on blood serum. And then uh, we do about 200, 250 individual FEC counts as well in a year. Um, that's just a quick picture of some of the like AID equipment. I mean, mostly we're on Cyan's now, those old agrodents are what we started on. Um, still got them, still use them. Uh, but we're probably on a little bit further down the line with with uh, um, data loggers now. Um, that's an, an auto drafter. I've got an electric one now, and uh, that gets a lot of use. Um, why would do it? We do it to better inform ourselves. So when we're making business decisions, as we've kind of expanded, um, we have um, money. There was no magic money pot when we went into it, so. We'd, you know, we function with um, high mortgages and a high rent equivalent. So we've, we're very uh, keen on making sure that anything we spend um, is going to deliver us a degree of value. And one of the, the the big wins, as Lawrence kind of alluded to when, he's previous, when he was talking about where they, their first year culling is, is targeting poor performers. I mean, the, we're the biggest win in, in most um, in most farm businesses, I think it's to either identify bad performance or cut out bad practice 
rather than being in the top lane and trying to um, trying to build on your top ten percent. You get very quick value delivered from eliminating your bottom twenty five percent, whether that's animals or bad practice or you know improving practice. Um, and this also, you know, um, if you if you can deliver sort of uh, welfare traits, also reduce the amount of labour you need. You know, you can if, if we can st uh, not be wasting dry matter on low performing animals, all that sort of thing um, builds up to give you incremental financial gain and hopefully a better lifestyle as well. I mean, we we that is certainly the plan of ours, but we just tend to. Um, keep more sheep uh, or cow and that um, and you know we're measuring as I come on I'll, I'll move on off individual animals onto some of the the feed budget and we do um, but you know that's just an example of some of the uh, some of the things we've been able to kind of quantify um, it's just a, a, like when we're talking about informed decisions, I just found two from last year. I've used most, a lot of what I've used is 2022 data because that's a complete season. So these were two management groups of lambs. <laughs> and it gives an idea about what like several advantages between one and the other gives you, but it also gives you an idea about um, about the added value in in. In a, in a few things in the uh, in a few things in your decisions in your management that are really one of the what we can very we can do very little about the price we're given or the input costs that come our way whether it's fuel or energy or feed or uh, fertilizer you know but we can take a huge amount of uh, value out of out of you know identifying uh, what we're doing within the farm gate so these are two two management groups of lambs from last year we we'll have a, the top one were on good ground, um, not clean, uh, so they did have parasite challenges. Although we did we, we, we did use a lot of FEC, so we, we were treating for any parasite challenges that came across. So there was a one treatment for a nematodirus and one for coccidiosis. Uh, the growths aren't a disaster by any stretch of the imagination, um, but as you can see, the one below, which sort of uh, gives a sort of a lie to cuckoo lambs. They were late born, sort of May born terminal lambs, but were born and went straight on to clean grazing um, with plenty of it. So we're able to, as you can see, that's a, that's a big, that's a big gain at 56 days. So if you have lambs coming in at three, three kilos heavy at 56 days across 2000 lambs, it's going to make it, it, it delivers a lot more live weight. Um, what we do for tracking performance, I just took the individual numbers out of this. Um, so this is last year's 2022 born ewe lambs. Most of them were, well, pretty much all of them went the top, most of them lamb. So it just gives an idea about where we are going with that management group's performance. Um, so we have, as you can see there, they were growing to weaning. They took a, a little bit of a weaning check and then started growing again. At eight months, it's probably when the rams went in. They they pretty much flatlined through that midwinter period, and then we got them growing as the lambs went in again. So we were, we were weaning weight was around that sixty kilo mark, which we're pretty pleased with, to be honest. They were on very good going, uh, and then you uh, then we're as we're weaning, you can see where the weights are going. Then there was a little bit of a weaning check, and and probably because we've been drying them off on not 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 bare pastures, but probably less energy dense feed because we're pretty keen. We've just, it's one of the things we've targeted with, we think it's one of the things we can really improve is, um, is first lactation performance. So that we're pretty good. We're trying to target you lamb performance. Um, so a little bit on the breeding selection. I just snapshot this off a, off a, a an analysis screen about how, what we would use to um, drop out um, poor performers. Um, so that's some of where we some some of the um, uh, condition variations. One assisted births are there. Lamb mortality, stillbirths, as you can see in that. I, I snapped that out of the. I, I lead tabled it on twins, and I just snapped it out the middle so you can see 
Um, so there's a variation what we would cull for. So uh, obviously mortality, uh, there's a one in there with um, two assists and two dead. Uh, as you can see, it's the daily live rate gain isn't that good. She's not a light you. So as you're going across, that would almost, I mean, we probably don't cull them. We'll have a B flock that goes to the RAM Compare project, which is uh, a lot of you have heard of. It's a, it's a commercial progeny test. Um, and there's a one in there that I, I think is pretty good. Yeah, uh, right in the middle. I don't know whether I can see me mouse, but that one there is twin. She's had three, three. She, she's a twin this year. She's had three. She's never been assisted, never lost one. Average daily live weight gain staying in the 340s. She's only 64 kilos. A one condition score variation. I really like the idea of uh, not having much variation in condition score, as little as possible. There's one there that's floating about too much, and that is probably one of the lower end of our um, uh, of our priorities. But it's certainly something we're taking into, into consideration is that that floating uh, condition score variation. And on that further on on that screen, we can go into um, uh, individual efficiency scores. Um, we probably would just look at that as a um, as poor performance being dropped out rather as. Uh, I, I look at these and take out percentages rather than looking at every individual animal just simply because of the, you know, you could spend an awful lot of time doing that. Uh, just an example of uh, this, one of our stock rams, we use, you know, we're, we're performance recorded. So this is a, a one that's a pretty good, pretty good index and figure the ram, but like it just goes to show that the it, breeding the perfect ones, uh, difficult because he's not so great on his um, on his parasite stuff, but uh, very good on the the yellow ones are more the maternal maternal based stuff. So we're looking for um, a good scan weight, um, good eight week weight, litter size doesn't have to be too extreme, um, and and something that holds its condition around slaughter. Um, this is an example of pro. Well, hopefully the progress we've been trying to make. Well, so we started recording. So I had a screen of this from two thousand and seven, but I thought that's probably going too far back. Um, you can see these terminal arms there, uh, and it'll be more obvious to where where we are. But the the idea was that we, the system we're running now for um, cash flow and double cropping on good arable breaks, really is quite imperative that we're we're, we're compress the the uh, days to slaughter on our terminal labs so like with it, because because of the farm system we'll have a really low cash flow period in the first sort of um so well not so much the first quarter but the, certainly the second quarter to halfway through the year so um so we we'll really need to be selling some of our terminal cross lambs at quite an early age so we're really targeting that and that's one of the traits we're really really focused on so you can see if you if you kind of keep that in your mind the 2012 lambs we really are trying to compress as many as we can into that sort of first sort of 12 weeks um of uh of of, of, li of life i mean it, they have a short life but they have a good one and that's what i kind of like to think um so it's quite an important part of where we're going and we've been able to track this and, and it's a low progress isn't linear. It has been with a few blips. The more we focus on on achieving it, the more success we've had, which you'd hope that would be the case. But it does, you know, having data on data on farm you, that you're able to call upon does re, it, it's a nice thing to have to reinforce the decisions. And and it also is a lot quicker at flagging up your wrong decisions or your mistakes or what we what we've got uh, any any um problems that we'll have to try and alleviate um so that's just a quick like a little fag packet thing really i mean i don't know we don't sell live but i thought two i, lo I was looking and i thought two two pound fifty a live kilo this year might not be too far off it so the uh, the thing about this is you can put whatever numbers you want to put in and whatever kilo weight you, you, you are looking at um, thinks achievable. But the fact of the matter is that those that sort those sort of improvements deliver something without extra use, without extra labor, without an extra scan. 
it just delivers stuff from be you know from your from our actions behind the farm gate so you know we take away we're trying to take away the vagaries of a as much as we can of a market so we're still able to trade on a on a low trade um, and we're still able to hopefully um utilize like organic premiums when they're available um, so this is a just a, this is actually a little snapshot of where we're going with the feed management. This is Farmax, just our pasture growth curve. As you can see this year, where we've taken on um, the extra three hundred hectares without actually raising stock and rate too much, we ended up having a good grass growth year. We've ended up in a in a much higher covers than we would normally expect to. Um, the, the new ground isn't on Farmax, but the animals on there are taken off this grazing platform. So the bottom line is the minimum dry matter that we need uh, on farm to graze what we to to graze what we allocate to grazing and not being supplemented. So that is that is everything that we need to deliver to the far like to the animals as grazed grass. And as you can see, we shouldn't um, come off. The wheels shouldn't come off, or they'll take a bit of dropping off this year. But the problem with that is, of course, you're, you're, we're, at the minute we're underutilizing our resources. So that will have to, the, so we know where we are, and we know we're going to have to drag them, them two lines closer together. As you can see in the previous year, uh, where we we're at, and we're still pretty good because we had a decent grow in October and November. And we'll want to keep that distance. <coughs> if this was a live screen, I'd probably be able to go back a year and show you a much tighter pinch point in that sort of mid-April. But uh, last uh, uh, this April, we came through it pretty well. Um, so we're happy enough with how that goes. That's about as close as we want to be on this. Um, uh, it could be closer, and you can come through it quite well. But the, your, your margins for um, for like wet or a late late growth, probably we don't wouldn't want to be much closer than that. Um, is that my last one? That's my last one. Sorry, I hope I didn't pull through that too quickly. Um, that, that's absolutely fine, Duncan. No, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, mm. One question that's come in: all your slides of your lamb growth rates. Yeah. What software are you using to do that on? Uh, this is Farm IT. Uh, so it's the Border Software. Um, that's what I started with when we first started in two thousand and seven. Though we use loads of software, we use AgroWeb. Agro we use for like paddock management and mostly uh, though we don't have individual animals on it. Like Farm Max is there. Uh, I do grass check on Agronet um, and I uh, have um, uh, Farm Matters, uh, which is a, a like a program that was first started on. So that we, we everything goes on there. So yeah, we'll have too much software, but we've never gotten rid of any of it uh, because we're tragic like that. Well, Farm Matters is a local software to you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, not, it is. But... It's, re it's really good, uh, quite intuitive compared to a lot. Uh, you know, it's uh, we get on with it quite well. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I like them all, and honestly, we would drop them if we thought that we weren't gaining value from them. But um, as long as everybody's able to run them, um, I kind of look after Farm Max because that isn't – it's quite deep. I mean, you know. It's quite a deep one, so you had kind of it's a one you it's a it is a one you have to live, um. But far, far, uh, far max is a different um, different ball game. Um, yeah. If you do, if you don't mind, stop sharing, Duncan. Yeah. Um, we seem to have Lawrence back again. If oh great, if we are we're. I'm sorry for everybody, but we are running slightly behind time. I was wondering if we can get Lawrence's slides back up and quickly run Thanks. through them, Lawrence. I've got on mobile, Matt, so hopefully um, we're talking about technology and it's failed me slightly here, so I do apologise. So if we can... The, Katie, I can, can share you, them from my side, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Perfect, please. And Sorry, if anybody's got any questions, we're doing the Q&A questions at the end. If you'd like to put them in the Q&A box, we'll rapidly go through all the questions at the end after Neris has finished talking. But if we can go back to Lawrence's presentation. Yeah, just trying um, to and try and pick up nice from where, where he was. And we can... 
We're about at the vet med stage, if I remember correctly. Big bait. Oh, see where we are. Somewhere about there. That uh, looks pretty over good. To you, over to you, Lawrence. If... Thank you very much. Hopefully, I, I stay with you this time. But uh, no, uh, attempt number three. Um, I, uh, I I speak to a lot of people about AgriWeb and amalgamating all of the many folders and bits of paper that they seem to um, to gather to make sure everything's ready for inspections or just to make sure they are where, where they need to be. And one of them that I'm asked of quite frequently is, is vet meds and how easily that is to have your inventory on there, record which animals have what treatment or vaccine or wormer or whatever it is that you, you drench them with and how easy it is to, to, to visualize that. And this is a very quick snapshot of exactly what you can see, which animals have had. We're, we're on the Heptavac system. Uh, some of the uh, the gimmers were Toxavac this year, and that gives you a little bit of an idea of what that looks like. And you can go into whichever detail you need, and you can run a report for um, necessary inspections and whatnot. If you want to go to the next one for me. Oh, very smooth. Thank you. Um, here, I, I selected a you just at random. Um very much like like Duncan has it's you know there's a there's a, a very quick easy view to see that particular you if you've, you've seen her in the field what's going on what's her history um there's no need to just say oh she looks good I think she's all right um I think we'll keep her or or maybe she's on her on her last legs or whatever discussion you seem to have in the field or in the shed this takes all of that sort of indecision or, or ambiguity away and you can see exactly how she's performing um, you can see how long she's been on farm for, what her, her breeding is. Um, if you pop to the next slide for me, here's just a, you know, scroll down on that particular view. You can see all the sheep that she's given birth to. You can have a look at that into more detail. And again, into her history, when she's been shorn, when she's been scanned, every field she's ever been into. And from that, there's a lot of traceability. A couple of years ago, we had some sway back three or four lambs selected we could see exactly when they were in the same field together and we were able to identify which paddock it was that was causing the issue we were then able to do further tests and we were able to resolve it very very quickly instead of just sort of saying get the vet out loads of blood tests again and that indecision and um you know lack of information this pulls it all together for us just as duncan was saying quick easy very responsive not looking at whether or not something might be good or not good or could you remember where's that bit of paper here it is and uh, no questions asked really um, and again just a little bit more information just showing you exactly what it is that they look at no that's grand I'm, I'm aware that I can waffle and I think we're all very passionate about talking about it we could go on till 10 or 11 at night but um, I think the important questions are why we record, what to record, how to record. This is the, just a few pictures of our setup. We're part of the Smart Sheet program, and we were demonstrating a little bit about how our system looks. Very, very, very lucky. I understand that not everybody can have a, a nice um, old indoor arena that's turned into a lambing shed. Combi clam, we, and we have everything that we need to really demonstrate what the cream of the crop could look like with an, with an almost unlimited budget um, and then whittle that down and personalize, personalize that to each farmer and what it is that they can achieve. Um, but from my history out with um, agriculture, really I don't know of any other industry where recording input, performance, output, cost isn't the sole structure of how the business is successful. And that's what I emphasize to a lot of farmers who are maybe a little bit dubious. Um, and um, this is sort of what we what I was talking about in this particular situation. So I would say record as, as little or as much as that you can you can do with, with what you have. I would record because I think it's a necessity for farming moving forward to make sure that we're as efficient, as effective as we possibly can. And I would record 
in again the most accurate and efficient way you possibly can most of us have got smartphones most of the software that that duncan seems to have a plethora of, of i would say you're doing a great job there with everything needs to go except for magri web duncan um and um yeah we you know it's super easy middle of the field my boss and mentor, she won't mind me saying, is very close to 80 and was a bit of a technophobe, but very, very passionate about learning and, and doing what she can for the best of her flock and her and, and, and what she could do. And she is completely literate with AgriWeb, loves it, can look it up, got rid of hundreds and hundreds of sheets of paper. Um, and I would suggest some sort of EID scanner and an app on your smartphone is a great, great place to start. And you'll see a huge change in your efficiency and the way that you run your farm. Um, yeah, very mindful of time. Um, and if anybody would like to talk about it more and you want to get rid of a 10 to 15 hours of me waffling, then please feel free to get in contact. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, very, very interesting. Now we're going to go over to Neris Wright. Uh, Neris Wright is actually, I should give her a full title. She's Dr. Neris Wright from AHDB. Um, Neris is your knowledge exchange, if I remember rightly, is your title within AHDB for the Southeast region. But she got a, a doctorate in body condition scoring and with sheep. So we're going to learn what trouble she put me through to be able to get that doctorate. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm really nervous about the technology now because when it goes wrong, I feel, you know, we're so vulnerable, aren't we, when we're here? Um, can someone just tell me when it's sharing? Is that okay, you're, Matt? You're sharing, yep. Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah, so thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, love talking about body condition scoring. Um, I've seen the list of people who are on here and many of you have heard me talk about it before. Um but yeah, it's really good to be part of this week. Just a bit of a shameless um, plug, really. If any of you are at Birmingham tomorrow, then my colleagues are running a session on change and attitude to change in the afternoon. So do pop along and see them if you are in Birmingham. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about condition, well, condition in general, but focusing on body condition more so than live weight. Um, and you know, I'm going to briefly discuss some of the key findings. I can't really do anything briefly, but I'm going to try my super best to put what ended up being seven years of research into 25 minutes. So if I try and rush, bear with me, that is why. Um, but it's just really good to know that um, I'm not the only one on the body condition bandwagon. I was listening to last night's um, talk on new efficiency and health planning and body condition score came up on several occasions. So that's always quite good to know that I'm not the only one who's keen on this topic. Um, but before I go any further and I forget and I rush at the end, this project really was not just me. Yes, I got to go up on the stage in my ridiculous hat, but it was really a joint effort between the project flocks, Matt being one of them when he was a manager at Diddling, and the two other farms, um, we've got Gareth Owen and we had um, Sanderson's up in, the, up in the north. They dealt with me for four years and every year we asked for more and they never got anything in return apart from some interesting graphs and some discussion about what it all meant. Um, an integral to the part as well was a project as well was Leslie Stubbings and Liz Jennifer um, as both of my mentors. And it was done at the University of Nottingham with uh, Kevin Sinclair and uh, Nigel Kendall as well. So just before I forget to say all of that at the end. Um, but really, I'm not going to spend too much time in going through what is body condition score. There's videos on YouTube where we can talk, you know, there's videos, I've, I've done some on how to body condition score, where to put your hand and that sort of thing. I just don't have time to cover that in 25 minutes as much as I absolutely love talking about it. But really what I wanted to talk about today was we've heard from Duncan and we've heard from Lawrence about what they're doing with data, how to collect data and some of the software packages out there. Um, and this project is really a good example of collecting data and then what we found with that data. And I, that's the really useful and interesting thing because we can collect all the data in the world. And if it just sits on a computer somewhere, it's, it's, it's a waste, it's tragic. So it was really about looking at that data. 
So body condition score, we know it's a management tool on farms, and we also know it's fairly underutilized worldwide, not just in the UK, but it, it, I would say it's, it's perhaps not used as much as we possibly could use it. Um, and I think, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about some of those reasons why, but the emphasis really, you have to put your hand on the back of the U. Um, that wool hides a plethora of things. So just to emphasize one of the things that came out from the survey that I, that I did as part of my PhD was that many still like to visually look at you condition. It's absolutely fine. A good stockman, you will know whether they're well, but you're not going to notice half and quarter condition score changes by looking at them. That's where you really have to put your hand on the back. So we know it's a scale of one to five. It's very obvious when they are one and five, but it's those in the middle when we're going from, you know, three and a half to two and a half, um, and we're at two at weaning. It's 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 those sort of in the middle that actually are what we need to be focusing on. You can see your ones and fives without putting your hand on nine times out of ten. Um, so it's highly repeatable. So you can go through and score those U's. Yes, you will agree. Like I will agree with myself ninety percent of the time. So if I go through those U's, I will change my mind on not on one out of 10 but that change is so insignificant in terms of the in, you know whether it's 3.25 or three the next time so i think one of the things is not to overthink the scoring um and you'll know as good stockmen whether it feels good enough for your farm or not good enough and then how you you split that out so we've heard great examples um of the data that we can collect i'm sort of thinking more of the where do we get started and how can we build up to that? So it would be really good at the end, Duncan, to have a chat and see what did you collect first and how did you get addicted to it? Because it is an addiction collecting data. And the more you have, the more you want, and then use it more and you just carry on and carry on. Um, it's a good reflection of flock nutrition and or health. So if we know the nutrition is spot on and they're still losing body condition score, we look at health. But being biased in the way that I am, if yous aren't where they need to be, my first thought is always nutrition. Um, and then if we know that's right, we move on and get the vets in. Um, and really to look at using body condition score to drive those management decisions to feed more, feed less, do what we need to do. And it doesn't really require any specialist equipment. And some of you will be going, yeah, it does. Well, yes, handling them you're going to need to be able to contain them unless they're super tame and there will be need a need to format some of that data in a, in some particular way now you can go full on eid you could also just get your marker pen out and get a, a spray can out and mark them and you know do those sorts of things you know sometimes let's not overthink it we can go full on eid excellent the technology is there but again, any way that we can identify those that are under condition and, and get them get them moving upwards. So, yeah, that's what I was sort of talking about in that respect. So the project farms, we collected four years worth of data on three farms and EID was absolutely um, integral to this. We would not have done this project without it. The ewes were EID'd and then the lambs were tagged and linked to their mums at birth. Um, and when we started doing this, you know, EID was was mandatory, but we hadn't really done anything like this. So data collection was with EID and we exported all of that data into an Excel spreadsheet. And I'm going to be completely honest and say my biggest challenge throughout my whole PhD was getting that data back out of the software in a format that I could use it. So it took us a good year and it was excellent. We worked with them. Um, the software company to, to create a spreadsheet where we could basically take take it out into a, into a workable spreadsheet. But I think it was just a great example of we had the data and, and we, we wanted to do something with it and then we had to find out how. So I was listening to Lawrence, the why, the when, the how, you know, it's, it's just really important that we think about the EID, what, what data do we want, why do we want to collect it, and then try and find the package that's going to fit our farm think of it like buying a car you know you, you want the car do you want three door or five doors you need to get a pram in the back you know you get car seats in the back you work out what you need the car to do and then you go looking for that car so you know sometimes i feel we, we buy the software and then we think oh we need it to do this oh it doesn't do it so it'd be quite good to turn it on its head a little bit if, if we're looking to invest in that software for sure and make the, the best out of it um, so we collected U body condition score and we did collect live weight data as well. Um, there were, you know, there were links with live weight, but it, 
there's so many other things we need to think about with live weight. So I'm not going to focus on that too much this evening. So we did weaning, mating, scanning, lambing, and then we did eight weeks after lambing as well for the ewes. And then we had some lamb weights at birth, but we then we had lamb weights at eight weeks and weaning. So they were the sort of key data points. Neris, so I'm not going to, so, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, your stop sharing button on your app is blocking some of your words. Could you um, <laughs> drop it down for us? Thank I you. thought that was just on my screen. Thank you, Matt. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is a very busy slide and I absolutely get that some people will hate it because it's numbers and words. But I just wanted to highlight this was a long, long a, a summary of a lot of work. But it was about so you've got your proportion pregnant here, which is whether they are pregnant or not. And then how many lambs they they are carrying. So I'm going to focus more on this because there are more factors affecting how many lambs they carry more than whether they're pregnant or not. So there are very few things that affect whether they are pregnant, you know, sort of barren, empty at scanning. But it was just quite interesting that weaning and live weight in the previous production year was having an impact on the number of lambs scanning scanned the, the next production year. Um, so that's that's much earlier than perhaps we've we've really thought about before. Um, well, mating was significant, but what was again quite interesting was that change between weaning and tupping was not significant, which was suggesting that it's already predetermined by weaning what that litter size of those ewes are going to be. And we did see that last year when we had the drought and we had ewes that were thinner than usual at tupping, we were seeing the scanning results were down. And in many ways, it was really, in, you know, sort of supporting this data that we were predicting that was going to happen and it actually did. So it just gave this data a little bit more, um, well, credibility, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not going to overly focus on scanning. Scanning is not your be all and end all. Um, and that got mentioned as well last night. But my my take on it is if they're not there at scanning, then they're never going to sort of miraculously appear. So that's why I wanted to talk about the impacts of body condition score at scanning. And we've sort of looked at the condition between mating and scanning. And the advice has previously been to let them lose half the body condition score between mating and scanning. But this data, as you'll see here, is suggesting that actually maintaining or gaining has a, an impact, a positive impact on how many ewes are pregnant and definitely on that litter size, um, especially if they weren't at target body condition score at tupping as well. So one of the key things that came out of this project was the cycle of body condition score and how it's really, really difficult to, to put a pin in it and say, this is the most important time. And if you get it right here, you're fine. And you can fix it at this point because it just keeps going round and round in circles. And as we saw, the impact of the previous, it, the, the week of weaning impacts next year. So it just becomes that really difficult um, circle of how to stop the negativity and when to put that body condition score back on them. So it was just highlighting really the long term impact of body condition score on flock productivity. And it's not just something that we can just draw a line at wean in, stick a load of feed in them, get the condition back up and they'll be right for tupping because we, we've seen that that impact is, is long lived. And the other thing that was quite interesting in the survey that we did was that we still had 60% of farmers weaning at 16 weeks or older. Um, now, if that was a management decision based on grass, lamb growth, ewe body condition score, et cetera, um, then obviously that's less problematic. But if the ewes were thin and being weaned at 16 weeks, they were having less time to recover as well as the lambs competing with them for food. So it was just, that was quite interesting. I said interesting a lot of times already. I find it interesting. Um, so effects during lactation then. Um, I'm going to sort of focus on eight weeks now. And it's interesting Duncan did as well. So um, lactation is such an important time and if you think about the, the biology of it, it makes complete sense. Yes, she's under less pressure in that her rumen's not squeezed, her dry matter intake increases. However, her energy goes from about 80 megajoules a day or requirements of energy goes from 80 megajoules a day to about 33. And she will be rearing one or hopefully two lambs. So she's under huge, huge pressure. And I really feel that 
you know, as an industry, we, we, we do look at late pregnancy feeding and that, preg that feeding throughout pregnancy and throughout lambing. And then I do sort of sometimes feel that once we get into lambing, perhaps we do feed, stop feeding a bit soon on some, like that's obviously quite a sweeping statement, but there are many farms where we, we perhaps are, aren't feeding them enough after lambing and reflective of what the grass is doing or what the weather's doing and the condition of those sheep. Um, so in the project, we looked at targeting um, 20 kilograms at eight weeks and 30 kilograms at weaning. Um, and this was an individual lamb. This wasn't a flock average because an average can be so dangerous because you can have so many at 15 and so many at 25. But hey, presto, you've got your 20 kilo target. So that was the, the sort of targets that we aimed for. Um, but so we saw the impact of weaning of the previous year at scanning and we saw it still happening during the next lactation as well. So it was at least 12 months impact of poor U body condition score at weaning. Um, and again, that sort of condition score between mating and scanning that we that we that I mentioned earlier, that also not only has an impact on litter size, but it also has an impact on lamb weaning weights as well. So that maintenance of tupping to scan in, and this is quite a good time to be talking about that now, because obviously tups are in, going in with many people. So eight week weights then. Um, and I, you know, when I first wrote this slide and we were talking about the data, we were saying it's emerging as important. I kind of feel now we can say that it, that it is important. And that my ears really pricked up when the farmer, I can't remember if it was Chris or Dan last night said that they based their placements on eight week performance. So I thought, yes, that's brilliant. Um, because what we found in the in in the KPI project, which we based my PhD on, was that um, it was important for the ewes, but it was important for the lambs as well. So it was important for the ewes because that was quite often when they were at their thinnest. It wasn't necessarily weaning when they were at their thinnest, um, but for some it was. But it will determine whether you wean at 11 weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, you know, whatever the, the system is for you. But the weight of the lambs at eight weeks heavily influences weaning weight. So basically those that are light at eight weeks continue to be light at weaning. And we saw that throughout, year in, year out on every farm, on all, all three farms. And at the same time as my PhD, there was another one with Andy Jones and he was looking at finishing. And what he found was that the weaning weight influenced the finish weight and the confirmation. So that just sort of followed on. So you could put the two together and say, well, your eight week weight influences when they finish and their confirmation. Um, so yeah, it really is having a huge impact. And then one of the things that we did on, on one of the farms was look at light lambs at eight weeks. So it's all well and good saying, oh, well, if they're light, they're always going to be those bad doers. Well, why are they bad doers? And how can we stop them? Because that's what we want to do. So worked with Matt on this, actually, and all any lambs that were 15 percent lighter than the target of 20 kilos, what we 17 I can't really remember why we came up with that figure I, I imagine it was something that Leslie worked out as sensible and we went yeah yeah that's great we'll go with it um but that that just seemed to us as, as sort of, I mean, they're not you know they're significantly behind enough for us to think that they're they're not doing um and we looked at how many of those lambs there were on each of the farms across the years. And there was an absolutely huge range. We, it, there's no industry figures on this because nobody's really looked at it in that respect. Um, Signet would have some data on this. Um, and we saw a range of between 8 and 35% across the years and between the farms. Now, much of this ranged um, on the year with the weather, body condition score, et cetera, et cetera. But we also then decided to follow those lambs through so in one of the four years so at the so the first year we were just finding our feet second year looked at light lambs third year thought what happens if we interfere inter intervene with those lambs and do something at eight weeks so matt identified those that were 17 kilos at eight weeks and then split them um left some on their mothers and then weaned some of them at eight weeks and put them on creep and what we found was actually taking them off their mothers did improve their growth rates and did slightly reduce mortality rates. But the big finding really was that they still were much, much lighter, not just through to weaning, all the way through. And they were the ones that were still there, you know, hitting scanning of the next year. So 
we were quite confident that we could say, you know, the performance of lambs is set by eight weeks. It could possibly be sooner, but we decided that eight weeks was sensible enough for time that miss mothering and it's that all sorts of things is possible. It could be sooner, six weeks, some are vaccinating at four weeks, weigh the lambs in and have a look. But we know by, by eight weeks, it does have an impact. Matt, you'll have to tell me if I'm going too long because I didn't even look at what time it was when I started talking. Um, no, so then we right, looked, no, keep going. So then we looked at why lambs were light um, and um, we looked at the number of lambs that had specific ailments, as, as we could call them, and then the proportion of those that were light. Um, and as you can see from this graph, 2% of lambs had watery mouth that accounted for three and a half percent of light lambs. Milk replacer, really like for like. So any lamb that had milk replacer, um, so that you didn't have enough milk. I think that just goes to show that we just nipped it in the bud. I say we, I didn't actually do any of the hard work here. It's the royal we. Um, so bad mothers, um, they were deemed bad mothers by, by the shepherd. One and a half, well, 1.6% accounts for two and a half percent of the light lambs. Mastitis, um, there was 1% of clinical cases of mastitis in the flock that year, but that accounted for over 5% of light lambs. Um, and then the same with intro, well, not the same, but 6% of entropian cases, but that only accounted for, for 3%. So with that, the mastitis one was quite interesting because what that basically um, boiled down to was out of all of the 15 cases of mastitis, or 15 lambs affected by ewes with mastitis, every single one of those was light at eight weeks. And not really unsurprising, I don't think, that you would not be wanting them to be suck suckling. Her milk production would be low, you know, that they would be struggling. I think we can quite confidently say why that would be. But we didn't really get a eureka moment and say, oh, well, it's that, you know, if we tackle that, we will just eradicate light lambs. Um, so, the one thing, and I know this is a really sweeping statement, but the percentage of light lambs did reduce as body condition score improved. It did, but it wasn't the only, it wasn't the only thing. So again, we looked at all sorts of different things and it did reduce, but they didn't eradicate as it were. So we looked at um, sex. So did, was there a difference between males and females? Was it significant? And then we looked at you age. And that was kind of a bit of a eureka moment. Um, so parity is the number of lambs that she's had. These were all um, tucked as shearlings. So first parity of shearlings, we didn't have any ewe lambs. Um, and 49% of the light lambs were from shearling mothers. And as you can see, it goes 19 and then 23 and then single figures when the ewes were much older. And then if you just look at that as a reflection of how many ewes were in the flock, just to make sure it wasn't being skewed by the fact that you know, there was a significant number um, of shearlings that year for whatever reason. There was a third um, overall, but over half of the lambs were, were light from, from a third of the flock. So that was a sort of eureka moment in that we thought, crikey, yeah, it's, it's actually how we're managing those ewes in their first lactation, um, particularly twins as well. So that led on. And again, this was talked about last night. So I thought, yes, it's not duplicating. It's just confirming. So um, we can't both be wrong. Um, so shearling, shearling ewes were consistently um, associated with lower litter sizes at scanning. And then obviously that followed on through to lambing. Lower eight week weights for lambs, higher light lambs at eight weeks and then lower lambing weights. So we really were looking at that and saying, right, our shearling management overall doesn't require some additional attention. I think overall we are good at doing that with our ewe lambs. Um, and I think it's just important to remember that it is almost ir irrespective of how old they are, they are still pregnant and lactating for the first time. So they are gonna be under, under, under pressure with that, um, you know, the secreting cells, milk production, and, and just knowing what to do. You know, it doesn't really matter how, how old they are when they're first tucked, well, it doesn't matter. It, you know, we still have to consider that. Um, so key points from today, I think I'm on time. Um, monitor you condition by handling the use. Please, 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 you will, you will notice. I, when I'm body condition scoring, I kind of make up my mind what it is before I put my hand on, and I am so surprised several times a day um yeah it, it that wall is 
is is is doing something special and that body condition score has a really long-term effect one of the things i set out to do in this phd was was identify the most important time to body condition score and unfortunately we couldn't do that because it just is cyclical it goes round and round and round the one time that we can intervene and she's not pregnant and she's not lactating blood is looking at weaning and using eight weeks to, to, to impact, to sort of decide when that weaning needs to be take, taking place. Um, but as we said, weaning is pretty much already setting the next production season already. So that that's the one time we need to be looking at. Um, so again, there was that sort of slight change in looking at maintaining or if you use a particularly thin gaining new condition score between mating and scanning. Um, and just the importance of eight weeks, really. We've talked about weaning for such a long time and the pedigrees have been doing eight weeks scanning for, for years. And yeah, we, we're now realizing why. Um, so I said, it's important for the ewes themselves, but it's also important for those lambs, sort of, well, ideally reducing them, but managing them. And that overall then highlighted the shielding management aspect as well. So I feel like I've rushed through that, but um, yeah, hang on, I'll just unshare my screen. Thank you, Neris. Um, there's a lot in that PhD, I can vouch for that. Um, have yeah. you read it though, Matt? Have I you have, read it? I have read it, you sent it to me and I have, well, I was live, my computer read it to me. Um, but yes, I have sat here and listened to my computer read the whole darn thing and it is, it will hold the fire door open, I will admit that. Oh yeah, I've got it here, I've got it here. This is how thick it is. They were all my little tabs for my Viva, but yeah, it's 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 a big document if anyone's struggling to sleep. Yeah, but so quality the... or quantity. <laughs> it's both, yeah, it's both. <laughs> but what, one of the big things that Neris has identified was the shearling management, and that has gone off, um, moved on to the next product project, which was Challenge Sheep. So out of all Neris's work. Challenge sheet was born. Uh, I think it's still got this is the last mating year of it, isn't yeah. it? Paris? Yeah, yeah. So it was a seven year project and it's now in its seventh year, which so, is frightening. That time has flown. So yeah. looking at so watch management, out for that. Yeah, management of shearlings and follow it through. And what Neris hasn't alluded to is this was the first time in the world that anybody had ever tracked animals through more than one year's production. So New Zealand, Australia had never tracked individuals through their lifetime so we were leading a way in using their data to be able to do that and they're very jealous of what that project released so yeah i think individual and link to their mothers as well matt i think that's the other sort of major caveat is that they're individuals but we know we know where they came from yeah so right if anybody would like to put any questions in the q a we'll go through to having the q a if duncan is there somewhere you there, Duncan? Yay, he is there. Hang on, I'm a, yeah, I've put everything back on there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll start off with one of the questions coming over what software you use. You went through that. Can you explain a little bit of um, you're using so many different software? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I for, for me, because I understand what you got at, you got two basically different lines you have. So you've got one for your grassland or got two for your grassland mm -hmm. and you've got two, four or three actually for your animal software. Yeah. I mean, the animal software, yeah. I'm, I generally use Farm IT because it links really well with Signet and gives you a lot of great analysis uh, screens and stuff like that. Um, I think we'll keep the Farm Matters one. Uh, it has a lot of data, so it um, so my brother puts the cattle and does the BCMS stuff on that. And, and really with Farmax, we came to that as a way of trying to uh, more effectively feed budget. So I've been running that since 2012. And, you know, it it works quite well in that it, it has a predictive uh, quality if you keep on putting, uh, if, you, if you're consistent about putting the data into it. But you do have to feed it a lot of data to get... A, effect out of it but if you if you do sit down and put in make sure you sit and put in your live weights and your um uh and you know cross measurements then it seems to work quite well 
Yeah, I've got to say, it's it's a New Zealand-based software that was developed with government money in New Zealand, um, and now it's a private entity. Um, but yeah, it's a powerful piece of software. Absolutely, um, yeah. Uh, and I know um, there is some grassland information in Agrove as well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, we tend to uh, we do measure and put it onto AgriWeb as well. Um, we use AgriWeb a lot because we have like staff now, so it's a really good thing of having a live thing on everybody's phone, so we can keep track of um, of uh, stock movements and set up set up subdivision uh, things like that. That's what we're mainly using it for at the minute. Um, uh, well, just so it's not double entry, really. I've never, we've never really bothered putting individual animals on it, even though I know it's very capable of doing that. Uh, so, yeah. Do you use it, Lawrence, for m monitoring your grassland? Yeah, very much so. I was just going to jump in there. We're, we're beta testing, or I'm, I'm beta testing along with other AgriWeb users the integration of um, another piece of software that uh, takes a satellite imagery of. of of um of all your grassland and inputs that so you have your your kilos of dry matter and obviously you have if, if you do put your individual animals in you've got all your individual weights of each each sheep and it'll then calculate based on that particular mob how long it can stay in that particular pasture for and how many days grazing you have uh, and very similarly it will give you a you know your, your peaks and trough in in how many heads of, of sheep you have so yeah we use it a lot and it's you know gone to the days of of the um the whaley with the bit of sharpie on it to say that's when they go in and that's when they come out and um, we've got a little bit more uh, information on there so you know attention can be placed on other things and we can safely um put animals in and, and know what our rotation looks like um it certainly doesn't make us redundant there's there's very much the uh, the knowledge and the skill of the of the farmer still needs to be utilized but no it's a it's a very integral piece of technology but if we could just get f farmers to put dots on their wellies and measure the grass that would be a great way forward yeah. as well <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um plastic sword sticks are available for my hdb if somebody yeah. wants a sword stick for measuring grass they work absolutely well as well um one of the other questions duncan that's come in um you using all this software, does it all synchronise together or are you double entry and everything? <laughs> no, it doesn't all synchronise together, yeah. I'm doing quite a bit of double entry. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example where it does sync, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's one of the things that come out of Nerich's PhD and it's one of the things that yeah. have come out of yeah. a research programme between Australia and the UK about synchronisation of software and hardware and bits and pieces. So it yeah, is I mean, one the of financials the in Farmax, you could, um, I know uh, if, if that would work with zero, I, I think, but um, uh, we don't use it. Um, I use the financials, the financial predictions at Farm Max, uh, but we haven't. No, I don't. I haven't used anything like that at the minute. Yeah. And so yeah, there's a lot of there is quite a bit of uh, double entry stuff. Um, yeah. But a lot of it, you know, uh, data entry once you've collected it, um, is uh, you know EID lets you collect, like you know I weighed four hundred lambs just like this afternoon. And it's not a not a big deal to do it once you've got a little just a true test that just clunks on so um, you you're uh, you've got a true test on top of your prattly um are you linking that to any apps or anything like that or are you just you letting the true test do its job on its own pretty much yeah when i'm when i'm outside a true test just does it on its own i mean i generally just put it back into a uh, into this pc uh, that's how we tend to do. It. Though I mean, at the true test apps there to use if you if you want. And um, when we're, the, we're doing the back scanning, the technician would take it away off the true test, but I didn't use it. Um, uh, uh, Lawrence, you 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 are you using true test as well, or you using yeah, like I, yeah, we 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 we're all true test. Um, again, we I've got I'm an Apple phone, but I've had to get an Android um to just help with the integration. But that we we link that straight to the true test goes straight to the AgriWeb app. Um, so as they're coming through the clamp and they're getting scanned, it links straight into that particular U that's been scanned and adds in either the the treatment or the treatment and the weight or the or the drafting or whatever happened. So. 
Um, that does cut out for us a step of having to take it off the true test and into the app, but it's very, very easy. True test work on a Excel or CSV format, and so does so does AgriWeb. So it's just as simple as onto the app, onto the next app, and it's it's very, very easy. Um, both of you boys are tagging your lambs at birth. Do you think there's any advantage? Is that a big advantage or can farmers, a lot of people here would be scared of tagging lambs at birth? Is it something they can yeah. still record data afterwards? Um, you go, Duncan. Now. Well, yeah, I mean, I was I was very nervous about it. Uh, we started doing it in 2007. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a real big advantage if you're going to, if you're going to actually generate a pedigree, um, it's probably it's probably essential in that respect. Unless you're going to spend a lot of time on uh, DNA capture, a lot of sorry, a lot of money on DNA capture, which, which would be great, but it is expensive. So it's um, we I don't know. It's almost self-selected itself. When we first started, that would be used with probably a poorer maternal score that you might struggle to record outside. But obviously, their progeny because we don't get, we don't certainly we don't breed replacements of anything that we don't get a full pedigree on they might they'd end up in the beef lot breeding terminals it's kind of it's probably brought a heritable trait a very heritable trait to the fore very quickly so um I, I would say it's not depends on what you're hoping to achieve we're hoping to, where we want to generate a pedigree so it's essential we do it yeah yeah, I can I couldn't agree more. I think um, it very quickly identifies the ewes that probably would have been hidden in a flock that are persistently producing smaller lambs. And uh, yeah, we're try we're we're a closed flock and, and producing our own replacement. And I think it's it's absolutely imperative that we la we we target birth to get the best out of all the, the efforts that we're, we're putting into performance recording and and selecting for that for those traits. Okay, we've got a question in for Neris. Um, did the older use would you believe the older users have better colostrum? Is that why they have less light lambs? Yeah, it's quite possible. Yeah, so I, I did see the question, question actually. That was Finn, wasn't it? Hi, Finn. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we did see a big difference. It was, you know, over half of the light lambs were from first time lammers um at eight weeks so we, yeah we, we definitely did see and it's not completely a complete shock because the first time they sort of give well give you know have a lamb it's the first time the mammary tissue is being developed it's the first time milk is being produced it's a huge undertaking for the body um so i expect that's probably why and like you say you know higher quality colostrum in in older use as well and the other thing just to remember as well if they are parity four or five that they're, and they're still there then they're, they're good use aren't they as well they haven't gone in in the past but yeah we definitely saw a, a link on age finn yeah um uh, one of the things i would say is that all the sheep all the nutrition was checked thoroughly on all the diets and everything so we know their nutrition was good they they were all lambing indoors on that project so we do know that they were being fed absolutely well so that was it would be more down to what the ewes capable of. Um, targets. We see that um, Duncan had eight-week targets. Um, Neris was talking about targets as well. Um, Lawrence, do you have some targets for your what your lambs have got to hit at certain points? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we uh, we scan. Uh, well, we weigh at eight weeks. Um, we're looking for the equivalent combined weight of, of lambs at weaning to be the same as the, the weight of the ewe. Um, it's a, the sort of a, the Clean Sheep Society have clean gold, and that's their kind of way of, of selecting for pedigrees, you know, a, a ewe that's producing a good sized lamb. Um, Targets are probably something that we need to do a little bit better. We're certainly not perfect on that front. We've been focusing very heavily on targeted worming and our bottom end um, and comparing ourselves to ourselves. We should probably start inputting more targets to be harder on the flock and pushing that efficiency a little bit further. So a direct answer is 
not accurately, not not accurately, but not specifically a target of what particular weight. No, we usually go on below average or above average. But if you had a 60 kilo you, you know, and twins at weaning, you're by default setting yourself a target of 30, aren't you? You're yes. pretty tricky for a single <laughs> to hit 60 yeah. at weaning. But yeah. um, you, I think you subconsciously got a target of 30 there at weaning for your twins. Yeah, so I think for, um, uh, yeah, so absolutely. If it's a single, it's lost on its own merits of being a single so we're definitely pushing for twins um equally if we had a 60 kilo u and it had triplets um it's probably gonna be a bit inaccurate in that fashion that it might skew those figures too but um i think it's trying to make sure that our use don't get too big we're, we're trying to push for uh, a you that that isn't upwards of sort of 75 80 kilos um meaning we're having you know near 40 40 kilo lamb at weaning is probably unlikely and not quite right for our ground and our, and our farm i think that's very important too is that you set goals for for your particular farm and your system but um yeah we're, we're still you know seven years in from starting farming and where we are at the moment is, is pretty good and we're still pushing those boundaries and learning from people like Duncan um, and utilising the software as best we can but the software and being able to record and get all that information quickly has definitely boosted our ability to get to where we are so in such a short period of time. I think one of the important things you said there Lawrence was learning from other people and I think that's one yes. big thing we need to is yeah. talk as an industry around everybody look at what each other are using and see which works best for us. Um, it, I think that's very, very important. Um, Neris, I don't know if we know, but one of the questions is when's Challenge Sheet project reports, results start coming out? Um, we've been we've been waiting for such a long time ourselves. Um, I don't know if we've got any idea yet, but I would still say it's three years away probably. No, don't be so um, uh, pessimistic, Matt. So the project ends weaning next year, but we are now in a situation where we've got fewer than a thousand ewes left from across all the farms. So the big analysis is starting this winter. And then once we've got next year's data, we're going to slot that in and rerun it. Nair has gone quiet or is that just me? Oh, no. Just you. you. Oh, I was going to say, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm never quiet. <laughs> never, but, um... never heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully by next, yeah, so we'll have next weaning, so next autumn, um, hopefully, Matt. Yeah, we're, we're not waiting because we've still got a thousand ewes there, there or thereabouts, and they are a significant sample because they are still there at seven, you know, whether they were tupped, you know, as one or, or two-year-olds. So they are a really important cohort but we're going to start building the models and running the models. I say we, Amy Brassington will, I won't be. Um, I'll be looking at what comes out of it. I've, I've done my data analysis now for life. Um, and then we'll be inputting the last thousand sheep and rerunning them to see what, what that does to the end. But yeah, look out this time next year. We should, um, we should start be, we should start to see some of the results. So yeah. Uh, one more question. We're getting short on time, but we did have a few technical hiccups. Was um, from Paul. He wanted to know if we kept the shearling separate. Neris, would we? Would you keep the shearling separate? Would you see a problem? Would you see advantages in lighter lambs, less lighter lambs? I suppose is the right question. Um, yes, yeah, so that that would be one of the things you could do. But the other thing I would also do is just sort of look at them in terms of how many are rearing twins versus singles, how many of them are, thin, are thinner shearlings compared to the rest of them. So one way could be keep them separate. Um, I think, was it just through to, through to weeding? So that, that would be something to look at. But equally, I'd want to go through the shearlings as well and look at particular ones that are struggling give some preferential feeding over others. If you've got a shearling rearing a single, she's not going to struggle as much as a shearling rearing a twin. So it's, it's something to consider, but I wouldn't just separate them and think, oh, they're separate, they're okay now. There are still some things I would look at within within that. So politicians answer, not a yes or a no. Sorry. Just to, <laughs> to push that on to Duncan, with the, 
flock of his size, does he keep the age group separate? Um, mm, no, apart from well, we'll arm as we'll, we'll you lambs. Uh, yeah. We're kind of looking for variation in the genetics, so the kind of but at mating, the 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 shearling, the shearlings are separate. The point of mating, or or close, or fairly close to point of mating. Any anyway, so we're really we're, we've really put a big focus on because I think we were falling down there. Uh, and I think our lifetime production fell a little bit. It certainly, well, you certainly notice it. I think, I think actually, from memory, I think Neris, you did a little a run for us, didn't you? Of a, of a really poor performing year, age of views, and um, of our two thousand and twelve born animals, and uh, sort of that really struggled in that first year of life, and uh, and the 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 perform poorly the entire. And uh, the are for pretty much their entire life, really. Um, so, yeah. like, so we're really. Good. I think we're we're kind of looking at focusing on really getting these new lambs growing. I know we're lambing them, so it could be easier on them. But uh, in first lactation, we've found um, that we're trying to get them to wait as well. And when when we we'll carve we we'll carve all our heifers or two, and we just think that the the key is is really giving them the in the first lactation as good as as good as you can possibly provide to them. Uh, but shearlings aren't separate in the first like in that once they're shearlings they kind of drop into the ewe flock. But I think it would be a good thing to do to be honest. But remember Duncan as well, your shearlings will be second parity. So they're not yeah, going to be under the same yeah. stress as the fact they're tupping as you lambs. Yes, they're going to be heavier, but that that sort of risk period of first time lambing is it's it's gone with you because they tucked as you lambs. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you looked at it like my dad calls me a textbook farmer, not a proper farmer. So textbook, <laughs> yes, you could keep your ewe lamb separate yeah. and your shearling separate and your thin one separate and your fat, and you'd you'd have all these 25 different management groups that you could yeah. never have enough field for. So, you know, it's looking at what you've got and you know, prioritizing those mm -hmm. those with the biggest wins, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely feel that when we haven't done our ewe lambs right, and especially things like when we're in tough times, if we have dry ewe lambs running, then we've, the biggest mistake we've made is just trying to get them through alive, mm -hmm. and that is not good enough, <laughs> and it really does affect them. So I, I, you know, I think I think young animals need well fed, and um, uh. And I, uh, you can do it in different ways. I mean, we don't feed any concentrates, but we would adjust stocking rates, maybe. Mm. Um, uh, but you can buy feed for them. Um, yeah. Um, well, I have one quick question. A quick answer from every, of um, our two farmer speakers is probably I think because I know what Nerissus would be. What would be the most important? important thing for you to record if you were starting out if you got to choose one thing what would you recommend to another farmer to record um i would say eight week weight early growth is a proxy for so much uh, worm resistance milk maternal ability uh, as long as you know as long as you have an idea of litter size so that might say oh litter size but um you know obviously when they're if they're alive um and they've been born unassisted i think i think early growth if you can weigh them at eight weeks and weaning then it'll give you a good idea of what the background's going to be i would say lamb, lamb lamb growth weights if you can and yeah if you can do eight weeks and then and, and uh, i'd like to say fairly regular i know that's not always realistic but um that would help you with so much you know it would help you absolutely with your you health it would help you with your target worming it would help you with you know forecasting and managing grass um yeah if you were to try and put effort into one thing i'd say land growth rates go on Neris, what would yours be well i'm glad you know because i was like i don't know because i could <laughs> I could justify every element of it, but I think, yeah, I think for the ewes and the lambs, eight weeks, because then it can just diverge and then help that year, but also the, the next year. I, th I think if you put a gun to my head, I'd have to say that, I think. Mm. What did you think I was going to say? I would have said you would have said eight weeks, 
weights and body condition score, mm-hmm. everything at eight weeks. Because that is we yeah. we do believe that's the big driver for setting up the next year, making your decisions for weaning, making your decisions on your grazing platform and everything. So I think I think we've all come to agreement that that first weight at eight weeks could be six weeks for some people. Yeah, you know, yeah. but that it first weight yeah. Yeah. that first weight is critical to start and understand what's happening with your business. Mm-hmm. And if you're gonna do what record one piece of data that eight week wait or six week wait is very important. I would and say I think, it really would have been, sorry. oh, sorry. Yeah. Liz. No, you go, I mean, Duncan, you go. No, no, it's like, it's just that if, if a lamb's much doing much less than 300 grams a day at eight weeks, then it's probably never going to make a productive animal. And um, I think- Is their feed conversion kind of ratio? Yeah, their feed conversion ratio that early days is absolutely fantastic. So, you like you say they, they never will even if you pump them full of concentrates you know it and that will be costly um but the point i was going to make was that i have forgotten the point i was going to make so we're all going to be left hanging with that sorry everybody yeah. <laughs> you're all going to be left hanging <laughs> well thank you very much to our three speakers um and uh, really informative talks and if you've got any questions i'm sure that these guys will be happy to take any questions, email them. Neris's email is very easy to find or email the NSA and we'll pass any questions on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, join us again on Thursday uh, where we're talking, what we're we talking about on Thursday, Jan, what's the title? Annual feed budgeting. Do you just want to plug the uh, sponsors again, Matt? Okay. Thank you very much to MSD, Alanco, Rapper, AgriWeb, British Wool and Cotswold Seeds for sponsoring the swap this year. And hopefully we'll see some of you in Birmingham tomorrow. And all of you on Thursday. <laughs> same time, yeah. same place. Uh, thanks very much, folks, and all the panellists. I really enjoyed that, actually. It's, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes, no. Thanks all very much indeed. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. Good night, everybody.